Okay, good evening everybody. I hope this this uh this microphone does not help me with your hearing me. It's not tied into the sound system. It's only tied into the live stream here. But I think I can project loud enough that you can hear me without it. Um, it yes, it just makes it easy for people with the phone since I'm so far away from the phone that's doing the live stream for them to hear. So that's why I'm using it. If you did not get a handout for tonight, they're in the back on that um, little black podium in the back. So actually, it's a music stand. If you want to grab one of those, uh, on the one side is our prayer list, and on the other side is our Bible study for tonight. And so we're going to take a look, first of all, at First Thessalonians, and then we'll go into our time of prayer, and we'll, I'll have a few announcements that we'll make at that time as well. But right now we're going to jump right into the Bible study, so I'm going to ask you to join me in prayer as we begin. Father in heaven, I thank you for this day and for your word and uh, for that uh, wonderful church that existed there in Thessalonica that Paul had so many good things to say about. Again, as we study the book of 1 Thessalonians, help us to be a group of believers uh, with attributes very similar to theirs, uh, with virtues similar to theirs, uh, that we might be a church that pleases you as well. So help us to learn from our study of 1 Thessalonians. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so if you're not there... We're in 1 Thessalonians. We started it last week. We talked a little bit about the background and looked at verses 1 through 10 as a whole, but really looked at the idea that it was a model church, and we talked about why it was a model church. Today, I want to concentrate on one verse, verse 6, and then Sunday morning, we're going to talk about, actually, in the, in the Sunday morning service, we have a missionary guest with us, the Shads. I say missionary guest, guest. Uh, he and his wife and their two kids, they have a one-year-old and a three-year-old, are getting ready to go to Spain. Uh, I they have a visa appointment this month to see if they can get their visa to go. And uh, so they're hoping to leave even as early as this year, but they're not certain yet. Uh, but they're, they're real close to leaving. They have enough support that they can do that. We have picked them up in relationship to supporting them. And uh, so they are now missionaries, official missionaries of Grace Bible Church, and they'll be with us for the very first time this Sunday morning. So I want to encourage you to be here, to hear from them and get to meet them, and uh, that, that hopefully associating their faces with their names will help you to remember to pray uh, for them in their ministry in Spain. A lot of people say, why do we need missionaries in Spain, right? Why do we need, isn't everybody in Spain Christian, just like all the Italians are Christians, and you know, we think of a lot of times those countries that are predominantly Catholic as being Christian, but really there exists, for the most part in those countries, a sort of dead Catholicism. It's a historical, traditional uh, Catholicism. Um, my, you know, a lot of people have grown up in mainline, it doesn't have to be the Catholic Church, it can be mainline denominational Protestant churches uh, where you just go through the motions every Sunday and there's no real relationship with Jesus uh, there's no real uh, relationship to the scriptures and being obedient to them. And uh, so uh, the missionaries that go there try to help to introduce those people to a living, vibrant, uh, born-again relationship with Jesus Christ, where they really come to know him as Savior, not just know about him. I've known about Jesus most of my life, but I didn't know Jesus, right? How many of you were in the same boat? You knew about him, but you didn't know him. And, yeah, so we're all familiar with that for the sermon. So, <laughs> okay, <laughs> well, um, verse 6, if we look at verse 6 here in chapter 1, we see it says, you became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite, in spite of severe suffering. You welcomed the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit, and so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. And so we, we mentioned this last week, that they, they came to believe on Christ in spite of the suffering. But what I wanted to do is sort of key in on a suffering and the role of suffering um, in a person's life. And so this is sort of a brief synopsis of suffering. There's a whole lot more in the Bible. It's a much more comprehensive uh, topic than what we can cover in one evening. But I, I do want to just cover some of the major points and then tie it into what Paul is saying here uh, to the Thessalonians. So we'll get to that, but we'll get to that near the end of the study. 
So first I want to start off with the, the whole reason for suffering. And on your outline, do um, you guys have blanks? There's blanks there, right? I, okay, I wanted to make sure I didn't fill them because on, on mine I filled the blanks in. I was pretty sure I printed it off before I did that. <laughs> so as we go along, I'll give you the, the word that's missing. Actually, I'll ask you if you can guess what that word is. It's pretty simple in most cases. But first of all, let's talk about uh, the role of suffering and how many people are going to experience it, where it originated, um, and maybe some of its purposes. So Acts chapter 14, verse 22 is a passage we've looked at on Sunday mornings in our study of Acts. It says, and it's referring to Paul and uh, Barnabas as they traveled on their first missionary journey. It says, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. And they said this, this is a, this is a really interesting statement. They said this to the believers, we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Again, we mentioned that that's not teaching that you have to earn salvation somehow. You know, you got to labor for it. You got to work for it. You got to do a whole lot. You better be out there knocking on doors and, and doing this and, you know, giving money to people and ministries and, and, you know, serving the Lord in numerous ways so that you can someday get to heaven, so that you can someday enter the kingdom of God. No, that's not what it's saying, right? We all recognize that. I hope that we all recognize that. And what it's saying is that there's going to, being a Christian will bring difficulties your way. There will be hardships just by virtue of being a Christian, and especially in the first century church where we see persecution pretty much in every city where a church was planted. Where it's starting in Jerusalem. There was persecution in Jerusalem. Saul of Tarsus was one of those who was involved in that. And then in all of, all of the other cities that later on, after Saul's conversion, he becomes the Apostle Paul. He begins to spread the faith throughout, um, you know, right, starting from the, uh, the city, his home city, um, all the way up into Asia Minor, all the way around to Macedonia, all the way down through Greece, and all the way back over to Jerusalem. And uh, pretty much every one of those cities, there was some form of persecution. That's what Paul is saying. Expect it. It's part and parcel of being a Christian. Uh, people don't like the light. People say, oh, we need to, you know, we need to be good, attractive, and, and we do, we do. But realize that it, just by virtue of standing for the morality that the Bible teaches and that Christ taught, by virtue of saying there's only one way to heaven, uh, you know, that, that salvation is singular in nature, there's only one Savior, there's not multiple ways, there are not multiple Saviors. By virtue of holding to those truths, the world won't like you. And it didn't back then. That's the Yeah, People are, today you're thought of as being narrow-minded. Well, what about all the other religions of the world? You know, certainly they got to have some validity. And, uh, so you're either narrow-minded or you're bigoted. Um, if you hold to the moral teachings of the Bible, you're prudish, you're old-fashioned, you're Victorian, you know, you're out of touch, you're out of date. Um, and, and so the world hates us. But that's not new. That's been going on since the beginning of the church. That's been going on since Jesus. You know, in John chapter 3, he said, men, men uh, don't come to the light. Why? Because their deeds are evil. And they, love, they love the darkness more than they love the light. And so that's not new. John 16, 33, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. You see that? Jesus said that. In this world you will have what? trouble. And that's not necessarily talking about car problems, you know, blo broken hot water heaters, <laughs> um, you know, things of that nature. I, I think it's specifically in relationship to living out your faith. As you seek to live for Jesus, you will encounter problems. And they're usually from people. And he says, he goes on, he says, but take heart, I have overcome the world. John seventeen fourteen. I have given them your word and the world has hated them. For they are not of the world any more than I am not of the world. And that's why I say it has to do with people. It has to do with the conflict of values, the conflict of beliefs, the conflict of, of um, you know, who the Son of God is. It, it, it centers around Christ. And the world hated him, the world will hate us. As we hold to the teachings of Christ, we will get a similar kind of treatment that Jesus got. Not in every situation, in every case. and Every, every part of the world won't be the same, but to some degree or another, we'll experience... Um, the hardships and the suffering, just like Christ did. Second Timothy three twelve. So all of these passages deal with that. In Second Timothy, Paul says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. 
One of the ways to escape being persecuted is to live like the world lives. In fact, you can even say you're a Christian. Just don't make a big deal about it. Don't stand for anything that's controversial. Just talk about, and, and if you just talk about love, 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 you'll probably be okay. You know, and if you don't draw the line anywhere on any kind of doctrinal belief, it, you probably won't encounter any problems. It's the moment you begin to take a stand on biblical truth. Or when you begin to live, I should say, even more so, when you begin to live biblical truth. Because there's some people that say, well, I believe this, but hey, you know, this is not a big deal. Or they don't live it anyways. So, Genesis, where's the beginning of suffering? You, uh, we don't need to spend a lot of time on this. It all started where? Why is there suffering in the world? The fall of man. Why is there evil in the world? Fall of man. It all, it all, all was introduced in the garden. Um, you know, man uh, wanted to be like God, right? That's what the devil said. You, he doesn't want you to eat it because then you'll be like him and you'll know good and evil. What did man know before the fall? Only good, right? Didn't know evil before the fall. Didn't, Adam and Eve didn't know they were naked. That came after uh, the fall and their eyes were opened and they, they, they did see good and evil. And, and since that time, they've sought evil, <laughs> You know, and we've been inclined or bent toward evil since that time. And most of the problems that we experience in the world has to do with evil that stems from the hearts of men. Most of the problems Jesus had were from wicked men that didn't like what he was saying, didn't like what he was teaching, didn't like his popularity, right? So they crucified him. Most of the problems that the apostles had stemmed, stemmed from the evil hearts of men. They didn't like the same thing. They didn't like what they were saying. They didn't like their popularity. Oh, look, at he's drawing away people after themselves. You know, some of our people will leave the synagogue and they'll go follow after the Apostle Paul. They'll join one of those, you know, Christian gatherings. And, and uh, it all stems from the wickedness of men's heart. And, uh, you know, there, there are other kinds of suffering. We do suffer sometimes, you know, from natural disasters. But even actually, even those are a result of the fall, aren't they? Because... The whole creation groans for redemption. So, you know, the animal kingdom was cursed. The plant kingdom was cursed. Thorns and, and uh, thistles came up. Uh, you know, would we have had wildfires had it not been for Adam and Eve in the garden? I don't know. I don't know that wildfires are necessarily always bad, right? But we do know people lose their houses in wildfires. That's another kind of suffering. But it's not a kind of suffering that's brought about simply because of their Christian faith. Now, it, let me add to that, because we're going to look at it in a little bit. It could be. Because you remember Job? And Satan brought some natural disaster into Job's life to get him to do what? To curse God. So maybe even, maybe even things like natural disasters uh, can stem from evil, from Satan. Now, not necessarily evil people necessarily, but... Uh, from Satan, and so I guess maybe I should uh, correct that other statement. <laughs> it's not always just from other people. Uh, sometimes Satan's at the bottom of it. In fact, a lot of times I think he is. So suffering, suffering actually is a result of the fall of man. Second Corinthians four verses eight through nine says um, that suffering occurs in, and the blank there should be various. I haven't been giving you the words for the, the first blank should be experience. Suffering is a part of life and the Christian experience. The second blank is suffering as a result of the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. The third blank is suffering occurs in various forms. In 2 Corinthians 4, verses 7 through 11, it says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, so... We've got different types of, of suffering here, mental suffering, physical suffering, uh, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake so that his life may be revealed in our mortal bodies. And so Paul recognized the role of suffering in his life as being that which uh, was helping to conform him into the image of Christ and, and also, I believe, causing other 
other attributes that we'll talk about a little bit here that moved him toward Christ-likeness, that helped him to be a testimony in the midst of that. The next blank, 2 Corinthians 1.4, suffering can help prepare us for ministry. Now, here's the, the title of tonight's study is uh, suffering. Nobody likes it, but it can have a positive effect. Here's one of those positive effects. I think suffering can help to prepare us for ministry. In 2 Corinthians 1.4, uh, so Paul is praising God who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Where do we learn to comfort people from sometimes? Where do we get empathy from? You know, I, I used to empathize with people who lost their dad you know, when their fathers died, but it was different when my dad died. Then I really empathize with people. I, I, know, I knew more firsthand what it was like to lose a father. And it's a little different when you go through it yourself, isn't it? When you lose a mother or when you lose a father and you've experienced that loss, especially if you loved them. And um, you know, now when somebody's father dies, it's like, okay, before I, I, did, I, did, I tried to empathize with them, and, uh, but I didn't understand the way that I understand now. Not that you have to go through every bad thing in life to truly empathize. Some things you don't want to go through in life. But we often learn empathy, and then sometimes we learn what Paul's saying here is how to comfort them in the midst of that. Because we ourselves sometimes are comforted by others, right? Somebody... Somebody knows what to say, what to do. They put an arm around you. Maybe sometimes they don't even say anything. They, they pat you on the back. They, they come over and cut your grass while you're busy doing other things or, you know, concerning funeral arrangements. Or, you, you know what I'm saying. We, we learn how to comfort other people. Paul says that you know, we learn God comforts us, and we learn from that uh, as to how to comfort others. So suffering helps to prepare us for ministry to other people doesn't make me want to go through a suffering <laughs> anymore, but I know that all, probably everyone in here has had some, uh, how many of us have had cancer? Raise your hand. I've had cancer. My wife's had cancer. Uh, Brian and Karen both have had cancer. I thought, well, I expected more hands. Okay. But so, the, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, I was hoping all of you guys had had cancer. No, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just joking. Henry, Henry. Yeah. Um, when, when, you ha when somebody announces to you you had that big C, now, I guess I was sort of mentally prepared because my doctor's office called and said, hey, you know, we, we want you to come in. We want to talk to you. Uh, can't you just tell me over the phone? You know, I'm a big boy. I'm not going to cry. Uh, now the doctor wants to talk to you. Well, I knew. I knew. Yeah. Because if you don't, if you didn't have it, if the test would have come back negative, they would have said, oh, you're good, you know. <laughs> so it's like, okay. And so when I went in, I think I had like a, a 95% um, assuredness in my own mind that, okay, it must have come back positive. And sure enough, it came back positive. So they, we had to deal with it. But, um, you know, when you, when you hear it, though, it still does set you back a little bit, doesn't it? Even though I expected them to say, okay, it came back positive. You know, you, you've got prostate cancer. And, um, but the good news is, if, you know, it's a good kind of cancer to get. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Can I give it to you? No. <laughs> so, um, and it is, in a lot of cases, it's slow growing, not always. Now, it's, it's highly treatable. There's multiple methods for treating it, but you don't want to have it advance into later stages. Some of us have watched some people here at Grace die from prostate cancer, and, it, and the end stages can be very painful when it gets into the bones and things of that nature. We had a, anyways. Henry, you raised your hand again. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I know my wife and I have had a lot of discussions because most of you know she was diagnosed with stage three Hodgkin's disease when she was 22, right? 22. And uh, we had um, a newborn that was eight months old, seven months old. And um, we, we didn't have, neither one of us had a job at, oh, I was offered a job here, so I was going to be working. Um, but we were immediately hit her laparotomy that was an exploratory surgery that they did down at a, the hospital here in Newport Ritchie, and they, they called me in. It now it amazes me how cheap it was now, but back then it seemed, I mean, I was offered a job here my first year teaching here for $8,000 a year. 
That was in 1982, which was not much, even in the 1982. But so, so I, we thought, oh, well, we can make it. We can make it. So I walk into the hospital. They want to talk to me after the laparotomy. And the, the lady says, uh, we need to know how you're going to pay this bill. Because our, we didn't know that we had insurance. Uh, this is a long story. But the bill was 8000 and some dollars. And I remember saying to the lady when she said that, we, we, know, we need to know how you're going to pay the bill. And I said, uh, I don't know how I'm going to pay that bill. It's a good question. I said, I will pay you as much as I can pay you every month till it's paid off. And we did, eventually we paid off all of our bills. Everything was paid. The insurance did come through. The state insurance commissioner made the insurance company cover some of it because she was misdiagnosed at first. Um, the policy ran out during that time. But God took care of it. And it helped. It helped us to have a different outlook on life. Um, it helped my wife probably even more than me to have a different outlook on life. But um, you, you look at life differently. When, you know, you're that close to, that was pretty serious. And in 82, the treatments weren't as effective as they are now. And some of you have gone through that. Others of you have gone through that. Flo, if you've never read Flo's book, read what she went through as a little girl. I'm amazed that she's still around. You know? <laughs> God just watched over that lady. And um, I don't know, Eric, I don't know if you've talked with Henry and Flo, but she has written a book about her life story. And it is an amazing book. And I don't know if they have any extra copies, but... Um, yeah, it's, yeah, so, you know, God, God has done some wonderful things in people's lives, and, and we learn things from that, right? We, Flo, did you learn anything from all that? <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, she could probably tell us story after story. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So, you know, there are positive, uh, I say all that because there are positive effects to suffering. That's one of them. We learn how to comfort others. It prepares us for ministry. Uh, moving on. Uh, make sure that I'm in the right place here. Yeah. This next blank, Job chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. Satan often uses suffering to try to, what do you think goes in that blank? Destroy. To destroy one's faith. You know, he said to God, let me at him, let me at him, and, and I'm paraphrasing it, but the, it's there, Job, you know, uh, and he'll curse you. And um, even his wife got to the point where she encouraged him to do that. But so Satan is trying to destroy our faith sometimes through suffering. There's another, um, there's a couple, I think in Peter, one of Peter's epistles, and then in the book of Revelation where it talks about Satan in the, in the role of suffering with the churches there. I don't remember the exact references, but I know, I'm pretty sure Peter addresses that in one of his epistles, and Revelation does as well. Um, the next blank, Luke 13, 1 through 5. Your suffering doesn't mean that you are a worse sinner than someone else. It's a, Luke 13, 1 through 5 is a really interesting story that Jesus tells. It says, now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? And I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think that they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Yeah, the people of Jesus' day were just like the people of our day. We look at something, somebody that something really bad is happening to, and we think, ooh, they must have done something wrong. Karma is getting them, you know, if they're not. Or if they're a Christian, ooh, God must be chastening them. And we, we look at a lot of times things that people are suffering, and we make the hasty wrong judgment. Job's friends did the same thing, right? Uh, that they're being punished by God. For something that they did. And I think what Jesus. Yeah, who did sin? This man or his parents that he was born blind. What did Jesus say? Neither. He was born blind for what purpose? To glorify God. To glorify God. And um, so we need to be careful about looking at people who are going through hardships and thinking they probably deserve it. You know, and the Indian culture, my understanding is from India that a part of their religious belief system in reincarnation and 
karma and things of that nature. Uh, you know, they, they reincarnate based on how they lived their past life. And so the poor uh, don't deserve compassion because they're suffering because of something they did bad in their past life. And so there you have a whole religious system that sort of does exactly what Jesus is teaching the disciples and us not, not to do. You know, you can't, now maybe, maybe God is in some cases punishing people, but we can't tell that for sure, you know. And so it tells these people, you think they're worse sinners than you? Nope, you're, you're in danger of hell as well. <laughs> so, you know, don't pass judgment on the others. I think that they did something worse than, than you guys. And so suffering doesn't mean, just because you're going through suffering doesn't mean that you're somehow a worse person. You know, sometimes, sometimes it is a result of bad decisions we make, right? Um, sometimes it's a result of, I say accident, I know, I understand, you know, God's in control of everything, but Luke the other night, you know, I had a green light, and he and Rachel pulled out, he didn't do anything wrong, and somebody ran into the side of him, and as a result, Rachel is still suffering, you know, with body aches and pains, I, I don't know if Luke has any still, but, um, you know, it, that wasn't that wasn't a bad decision on their part. That was a bad decision on somebody else's part, or they weren't paying attention. One or the other. They decided I can make it, <laughs> you know. And and actually, we have to be careful about even passing. How many of you have ever thought that to yourselves? I can make it, and it turns red as you're going through it, or even before you go through it. You know, probably all of us have done that at one time or another. <laughs> um, so sometimes, yeah, sometimes the suffering is caused by our own bad decisions, but sometimes it's just that God has a purpose for it. And we don't know what it is at that moment. Um, next, suffering, 2 Corinthians 4, 17 through 18. Suffering can help shift our focus, or you could say, or perspective, to what is more important and eternal. Romans 5, 3 through 4. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. You know, when, you, when you're suffering, it tends to um, take your mind off of the temporal things and you begin to look at that which is more important. I've often said, I, I just mentioned, I've, I've done over 100 funerals here at Grace. And a lot of those people I've visited in the hospital or in their homes prior to death, sometimes at the moment of death. I've been there a couple of times when the people actually died right there while I was visiting them. Not because I was visiting them, but <laughs> um, that it was just... I stayed there, and, and they gave up their last breath. And, but a lot of times we've talked to them, and I know Luke's gone, visited some, he can probably remember. I've never had anybody ever say to me that during those times of suffering and being near death, oh, I wish I would have worked longer hours and made more money. It's always, I wish I would have spent more time with my family. I wish I would have been nicer to my wife. Ladies, you want me to say that again? Um, so I wish, uh, or I wish I would have done. It's always about family. It's always about spouses. It's always about uh, the Lord. I wish I would have served the Lord more. You know, I always thought I was going to have more time. I wish I would have, you know, I kept saying I was going to do it and I didn't do it. it. It changes your focus, doesn't it? When you're really suffering, especially if you're thinking you're going to die as a result of that, if it's some sort of physical ailment, um, it, it can really change your focus. The bad thing is, is that sometimes then we get better, we get better, and that change of focus doesn't last very long. Sometimes it's only temporary, and we get better and it's back to life as normal. And when really maybe that change was meant to be a good change and a lasting change, and we should have allowed it to affect us on a permanent basis. First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.6, next blank. Suffering doesn't always hinder, now here's where we're looking at the text, hinder the gospel message. Sometimes I think it actually aids the gospel message. You know, um, Jesus ministered a, a lot to the poor, the down and outers, the outcast, the despised, and they're the ones who seem to respond the most. They're the ones who probably went through the most suffering in life because they were poor, because they were despised, because they were rejected. Because they were outcasts, because of some sort of social stigma, the Samaritans, or, you know, because of some choices they had made in life, and, and yet Jesus ministers to them, and we see them responding to that. Some of the people that seem to have the most in life, the people of position, wealth, power, and influence, 
didn't respond favorably to Jesus. I think sometimes suffering humbles us. Sometimes suffering helps us to realize, I can't solve all my problems. I can be the best driver in the world and still get creamed at a red light. Right? Or, you know, I ride a motorcycle. We, we know a dentist that died right over here where Ram's restaurant is on Little, Little Road. Him and his buddy were riding their motorcycles. They pulled up to the stoplight there and some older person came, coming up, didn't hit their brakes in time, didn't judge the distance that he, did, he was doing. Absol- he wasn't weaving in and out of trouble, oh, those motorcycle riders. He wasn't doing wheelies. He wasn't doing anything wrong. He was sitting at a red light. The lady plowed into him and his buddy. The buddy lived through it. It killed him. He wasn't doing anything wrong. Um, you know, but... Uh, you can be the, the best motorcycle rider in the world, and it doesn't guarantee that you will escape any kind of suffering, and, but sometimes um, the suffering actually helps or aids the gospel message. It doesn't always hinder it. Here, these people, he said, in spite of, in spite of their severe suffering, you know, they responded to the gospel message. Verse, uh, the next blank, First Thessalonians 1 Thessalonians 1.7, the way we deal with our suffering can be a, what do you think? testimony to others. First Thessalonians 1, again, 5 through 7, you became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. You welcome the message with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so, and so, in other words, what he, that so, when he says, and so, that's going back to what he just said, right? That takes us back to the statement he just made, that in spite of their severe suffering, they welcome the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. In other words, it's like, hey, People are responding, in a way, you know, they're having a rough time in life, but they're, they're joyful now. They're responding with joy to this gospel message these preachers are preaching. Okay, the opposite, yeah. Yeah, it can be a testimony or a hindrance. Yeah, people, people tend to watch, I think unbelievers oftentimes look at Christians to see how they behave when troubles come their way. Do we lose it? Do we get as angry as they do, as quickly as they do? Do, do, we, do we, you know, feel, have a pity party for ourselves? You know, uh, are we selfish about it? Nobody's, nobody's concerned about my problem. You know, are, are, how do we respond uh, to the suffering? And here they, in the midst of their suffering, they received the message with gladness and joy and in the process, they became a, a, a testimony, a model to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Galatians 6 2, the last one. We should seek to minister, help, uh, some, uh, some sort of synonym. Uh, we should seek to help or minister to others through their suffering. Galatians 6 2 says, Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Now, how do you do that? I would say it differs with each person in every circumstance. Sometimes it is just putting an arm around them. Uh, sometimes it, it's saying a kind thing. I've, I've been looking at Proverbs in our, uh, every Tuesday morning we have a, a staff meeting. And I share with the scripture and I've been sharing a lot of the Proverbs that talk about our tongues. I have to learn to use my words to be more encouraging. I am not a naturally encouraging person. I wish I was. I'm the sort of person that if you're doing everything right, Good. That's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> I don't, I, oh, I don't know. Ask my wife. See. <laughs> see, see. Now, you know, I've tried over the years. I'm trying to think because, you know, you can, somebody comes in and says, hey, Doug, man, it's good to see you here tonight. That can, you know, we're talking about that, but if, if I, I just said that spontaneously, could that in a way minister to Doug? You know, could that lift him up a little bit that day? Or, you know, somebody else, you, hey, how, how, how's it going for you? What are you going through? And then to listen. And to listen, you know, I, I don't often carry on a, ca- a conversation with a cashier because I know when a cashier asks me that question, how are you today? I know they really don't want to know. <laughs> That's right. But, but, but you can be the type of person where you stick around and you can use. I'll tell you who I've seen that with sometimes, Harry Chamness. I've watched Harry do that with unsafe people at, at the restaurant a number of times um, where he, he can be really good at that. And uh, it almost, I, I, I don't know if it's natural or learned or maybe it's just a combination of both, but um, I'm trying to 
learn to do that. And that may be the way that we help those that in their, in their suffering is with something we say. Or again, doing a kind deed for them, taking a meal over for them. And you don't have to wait for the church. You don't have to wait for the church to organize that. I have people that call me. Uh, 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 so this is sort of a beef. I have people that call me. They know somebody's sick. They know they just got home from the hospital. And they'll call me and say, Pastor Dean, is the church going to organize meals for them? And because uh, we, uh, I say, well, why do you want? Because we might want to take a meal. Okay, I can understand from the organizing side, but sometimes that that pers- they, they don't do anything about it unless the church is doing something. And I'm thinking, you know, if you feel burdened to take a meal over to them, take a meal over to them because chances are it's going to be a couple days before the church gets it organized, anyways. If the church organizes it, even if we know, I just found out today that somebody had surgery two weeks ago. Didn't know it while I was on vacation up in the Smokies, we had a lady uh, that went in and had hernia surgery. I had no idea till her daughter told me about it today. I didn't have any idea. And apparently no one else in the church had any idea either. Now, I'm not blaming anybody for not knowing because I don't know that she told anybody. But when we find out, you know, one of the things we can do is make a phone call or, or say, can I bring something over? You know, it might be good to ask them that. They might not want you to come over <laughs> with a meal too. Uh, so there are, uh, all I'm saying is there are a number of ways that we can probably do Galatians 6 too, right? And be a help to others in the midst of their suffering. And, and don't, you don't have to wait for the church. I mean, you can, it doesn't have to be an organized program. And certainly if it's somebody that doesn't go to the church, you know, the, a neighbor, you see a neighbor, um, that you can take something over to them or say something. I, I try to talk to my neighbors. I try to get to know them a little bit. Maybe not as much as I ought to, but, you know, even if they don't reciprocate with a high, a lot of, uh, uh, if I'm outside and I see them, I, hey, you know, it's just trying to be nice, trying to be a nice neighbor to them. I, I cut... I pick up their trash, I cut their yard, I do, you know, I do quite a bit, and, and I, I only complain to my wife about it, I never complain to the neighbor, <laughs> so I, I say that because it's not always easy to do those things, is it? You know, I want to go knock on the door and say, can't you pick up your own trash? Why do I have to pick up your trash every day? Not every day, but quite often, and... Uh, and well, I'm trying to be a good testimony, and I just pick it up and throw it in the trash. And it, you know what? It's not that time-consuming or that hard. It's just, I look at it and I think, I can't. they just walked out and threw it in the trash, and the other can's laying down, and the trash is laying on the ground. Why didn't they just pick that one up while they were there? You know? and in my mind, I can't understand that, because I, I always make sure i got a lid on all my trash cans. They're, all, they're in a neat row beside my house. You know? I'm not the neatest person in the world, but... Um, it's hard for me to deal with that. <laughs> that could be it. <laughs> that could be it. I don't know. So, but I, I you know, so I do it to, and I, and I don't complain. I do sometimes. I'm guilty and I shouldn't. Sometimes I say things to my wife. And, and I think, oh man, because it irritates. And I really shouldn't do that. That is, you know, that's just making, making her day worse. She's, What? Well, I do, yeah, I, 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 have, I have a right motive, but not a right attitude. Right. Yeah. The motive is, I want to be a good testimony. The attitude is, I don't like doing this. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah Stacy probably nailed it, so <laughs> I don't know. But so anyways, you know, if, if you, we all have neighbors, and we can all do things for them or other people. Um, be kind to people even just because saying things to young people that come to church I've always talked about that because there was an old man that I told you the story you probably heard it 10 times used to come up I don't even know his name he never did anything for me other than every Sunday he'd come up and he'd just put his hand on my knee and say good to see you here sonny and I always felt a little you know but I felt good that he noticed me he didn't do it to my brothers. There's five of us, my four boys, one girl. We're all sitting on the same pew side by side. And for some reason, he singled me out. And he would come up and put his hand on my knee and say, good to see you here, Sonny. Usually. And walk off. I don't know why he did it. I think the Lord must have laid something on his heart. The Lord was probably telling that boy needs some help. <laughs> Give him some encouragement. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 
But uh, how many of us can do that? How many of us can go up to a young person and just say something? Hey, good to see you here today. All of us, really, can't we? You say, you don't know, I'm, I'm shy, I'm shy. You can do it. We can do it, yeah. So whatever, think, we, and we probably ought to be intentional about this. How can we help people in their suffering, but even not in their suffering, even just, you know, sometimes, some of these, some people are suffering in loneliness, and we don't even realize it. They're lonely. They may even be in with a bunch of people, and still inside they're lonely. They're there can be people coming here every Sunday. Uh, they can walk around and greet people and talk to people and inside feel like I don't have any real friends. Right? That can happen. And uh, you can maybe be an encouragement to them. Let's pray. Uh, Father in heaven, sometimes we go through things. Maybe we've been lonely, sick, persecuted, made fun of, laughed at, uh, whatever it may be. We sometimes go through that so that we ourselves can learn how to comfort others when they go through it. And so help us not to be negligent in, in ministering to others in a variety of different ways uh, to those who may be suffering as well. Father, help us, help us to allow whatever suffering we go through in life to have positive effects on our character and on our life. And help us to follow through with those things for the rest of our life. And uh, not just when we get better, or not just after a period of a couple weeks, but may, may those things be true of us all of our lives. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. While I'm turning the live stream off, uh, on the other side, there's some prayer requests. Again, I don't know that.